This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. It's been a battle from the start. Uncle Cy on the inside and Samrod on the outside. And now there's nothing between them as they turn for home. And it's Samrod with a narrow lead. Uncle Cy continues to battle on down at the rail. Samrod by a head. Uncle Cy at the rail. The others are far back. Now they're inside the eighth pole. It is Samrod and Uncle Cy. And they've been dueling from the start. Samrod now prevailing by a half length. Uncle Cy is second and Samrat will stay undefeated he's four for four and he's won the withers the time was one minute 46 and one fifth seconds Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano. On this morning's show, we'll get things kicked off with our three-year-old segment and the Battle Royale in the Withers. We'll also take a look at, uh, we'll update our Derby Dozen and take a quick look at Pool 2 of the Derby Futures. Then we will welcome in a trio of special guests. From South Florida, Mr. Buff Bradley, whose dual champion groupie doll will be making her final career start in tomorrow's Hurricane Birdie at Gulfstream. We'll go out to Southern California and welcome in Mr. John Sheriffs, whose recent maiden winner, Cool Samurai, makes his stakes debut in this afternoon's Robert Lewis. Then it's back to South Florida, where we'll welcome in Mr. Rick Matee, who's got one of my favorites, Brujo de Aleros, coming back in this afternoon's Gulfstream Park Sprint. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our February 8th edition of the program. Again, good morning. Welcome to the show. You know, early February doesn't seem to be any better than January was, but we've got another snowstorm behind us, a little more cold weather behind us. Settle in, relax. Hopefully we'll have a fun show for you this morning. And we're going to begin with our three-year-old segment and begin with the grade three withers. Certainly not restricted to state breads, but the two big horses in here, a pair of exciting New York breads. Uncle Cy, a runaway maiden winner in last against Samrot. Number one, Uncle Cy, number five, Samrot. The latter unbeaten in three career starts, coming off a runaway win in the Damon Runyon. Now, interestingly, they not only appear to be the two best horses on paper, but they had similar running styles. They both possessed a great deal of early speed. On last week's show, we interviewed both Gary Contessa, the trainer of Uncle Cy, and Rick Violet, the conditioner of Samra, and we discussed, among other things, strategy for the Withers, and here's what they had to say. I just don't want, all I don't want is Samrat to have things his way on the lead. So I'm going to come out of that gate with intent. It's going to be, it's going to be probably a decision to make. But my feeling is come out of the gate with the intent on going to the lead and maintaining your position on the rail. And if Samrat wants the lead, we're going to make him work a little bit to get it. And then we'll stick the lead to him. But we're not going to hand it to him on a silver platter. We're, we're going to leave there running today, and if somebody wants to be in front of us, they're going to have to step on the gas. We're not, you know, uh, submitting or uh, uh, just yielding uh, the lead because we'd like not to be on it. I mean, some place I, I'd have a ton of speed in front of us, and, and we can kind of settle. But that doesn't seem to be the day. And uh, like you said, we, we, we it's actually a great post for what we want to do. Uh, we're going to break run and be very, very aggressive to the first turn. And if Gary's horse or Leah's horse wants to... Um, stay clean and not get dirt in their face, then they're going to have to, you know, shift a couple of gears and step on the gas. This had all the makings of a good old-fashioned throwdown for the call of the Withers. Here's John Embriel. And they're off. 
and Samrat is going right for the lead. Uncle Cy came away well down on the inside, and the two of them are right together in the early going. Uncle Cy on the inside, and Samrat on the outside. Uncle Cy has a narrow lead as they race into the clubhouse turn. Samrat is on the outside, racing in second by three. Street Gent at the rail in third. Classic Jock and Roll on the outside in fourth. Then it's Scotland and Honorable Judge. They head for the back stretch, and it's Uncle Cy leading after a quarter mile in 24 seconds. Uncle Cy by a half length. Samrat right there on the outside in second. A break of five. Back to Street Gent in third. And classic jock and roll is fourth. The trailers are Scotland and Honorable Judge midway up the back stretch. Uncle Cy holding on to that narrow lead over Samrat, the half mile in 48 and one fifth seconds. And there's less than a half mile to the wire in the withers. Uncle Cy by a neck. Samrat continues to press right there in second. Now they've opened up eight lengths on the rest of the field. Classic jock and roll moves into third. Street Gent followed by Scotland and Honorable Judge. It's been a battle from the start. Uncle Cy on the inside and Samrat on the outside. And now there's nothing between them as they turn for home. And it's Samrat with a narrow lead. Uncle Cy continues to battle on down at the rail. Samrat by a head. Uncle Cy at the rail. The others are far back. Now they're inside the eighth pole. It is Samrat and Uncle Cy. And they've been dueling from the start. Samrat now prevailing by a half length. Uncle Cy is second, and Samrat will stay undefeated. He's four for four, and he's won the withers. In a virtual match race, Samrat on the outside pressed and prompted the pace of Uncle Cy, and despite having trouble changing leads in the lane, edged away late for a very exciting one-length victory. It was a pull back to the third-place finisher, the Maiden Scotland. Making his fourth career start, compared to three for Uncle Cy, and having drawn outside of that rival, Sam Rott moved forward off a blowout win in the restricted Damon Runyon in last. A race where Rick Violet told us he had missed some training time leading into. Now following this effort, Violet said that Sam Rott was really tired. And that's not surprising, because when you have to run hard every step of the way, that's got to take something out of you. And it appears that Sam Rott will bypass the next round of Derby preps and instead wait for the Wood, the Florida Derby, or the Louisiana Derby. Gary Contessa, on the other hand, the trainer of Uncle Cy, was pleased with his Colts' effort and defeat and mentioned that he would likely come back for the March 1st Gotham. Now, it will be very interesting to see how both of these Colts, after such a tough race, how they'll come back and race next time out. Will they move forward off that battle or will they regress? A minute 46.31 was 2.18 seconds faster than the Phillies in the busher. And despite a final two and a half furlongs in a rather pedestrian 33.54, none of the closers made up any ground at all. Scotland finished a distant third, while classic jock and roll, who set a perfect trip, was fourth. Those performances, it doesn't always work out this way, but those performances don't exactly flatter Noble Moon, who had beaten them, you know, a couple of lengths in the Jerome. But what an exciting renewal of the Withers. Next to the west coast of Florida, the Tampa Bay Downs for the Sam F. Davis. And the co-favorites at 9-5, to five, number two, Noble Cornerstone, interestingly enough, had run very well in both of his starts. He was beaten, I think, just a neck in Remington Park Springboard Mile and last, but they decided to take blinkers off him. He was co-favored along with number one Harpoon, a recent big maiden winner for Todd Pletcher in his fourth career start at Gulfstream Park. So for the call of the Sam F. Davis, here's Rich Grunder. He's tied on and they're at the post for the Sam Davis. And they're off. 
Noble Cornerstone away a bit awkwardly. Harpoon is away sharply. Now moving up between horses, Cousin Stephen with Vince Ramos. And the last horse away, Noble Cornerstone. He'll spot him about 10 going to the first turn. Around the clubhouse turn they go. Cousin Stephen up on the outside and Vince Ramos. There toward the rail, Alik Danaf farther back. Asserting Bear with blinkers on today. He's sharpened into the bit, racing along third by a length. Harpoon skims the rail now fourth. School on a Hill is there fifth. A gap of three to Matador, carrying the John Oxley Silks. Then it's about seven or eight lengths back to imagine that mum. And at this point, Noble Cornerstone is far, far back. As they continue their journey up the backstretch, Cousin Stephen shows the way. Vince Ramos is there toward the rail second. Asserting Bear on the outside is now third. School on a hill. And Ronnie Allen Jr. on the move to the outside fourth. Harpoon is tucked in toward the rail fifth. Two lengths farther back. Matador is sixth. Then it's another seven lengths farther back. Imagine that mom and noble cornerstone is still far, far back. As they're midway in the turn, Cousin Stephen is now being shoved on. Asserting Bear on the outside. School on a hill is up on the outside now. Racing along third, and from between horses, Matador is full of run and swings to the center of the track. Harpoon is also gaining ground. He's back behind a wall of horses as they turn into the stretch. Absolutely wide open in the Sam Davis. Along the rail, Vince Ramos is still there. Up on the outside, Matador is now coming on second cousin Stephen. Here's Harpoon absolutely exploding on the outside. It'll be a four-horse photo to determine the winner. Not exactly a four-horse photo, but number four, Vince Ramos, a recent Gulfstream maiden winner for Todd Pletcher, edges his stablemate, the more highly regarded Harpoon, to win the Sam Davis by a nose under Edgar Prado. Now, folks, the dirt races I've watched over the years at Tampa, the great majority of them were won by horses who were well off the fence. So Vince Ramos, who was eased back going to the far turn, but who rallied on the fence through the lane, might deserve a few extra points for this win. Both he and Harpoon will need to improve, you know, to get to the upper echelon of the three-year-olds, but I think they've got every right to do so. Couple of notes in here. Cousin Steven ran pretty well to be third. Noble Cornerstone. They removed the blinkers. I mean, he was never a factor, never lifted a leg. My guess is, and it's an educated guess, that they'll put the blinkers back on next time. And the Canadian asserting bear enjoyed an absolutely perfect trip. I mean, when I was watching the Sam Davis the first time live, and I saw him, he looked like he was locked and loaded. He came up empty and ended up running fifth. Now, the final race in this segment, the seven furlong Hutchison. Um, what I'd like you to do is simply watch the two-to-one favorite, number five, Wildcat Red. His next start is going to be around two turns in the mile and a sixteenth fountain of youth. So watch him carefully. See how he rates and relaxes as we take a look at the Hutchison and the call from Larry Colmus. Goes in. They're all in line. They're racing in the Hutchison. And it's Gambler's Ghost who goes out to the lead. On the inside comes Mighty Brown. These two are the most early speed, and Wildcat Red is out running in third. Pablo Del Monte and Long on Value. CZ is going through in between horses, a length and a half clear of spot. Trail Blaze on the outside, and last is Tashir as they speed up the backstretch where Gambler's Ghost and Corey Lannery lead the way. Mighty Brown, CZ, and Wildcat Red right behind at 22 and 1 opening quarter mile. Pablo Del Monte behind horses. In tight there, running in fifth. Joined on the outside by Spot. Long on value in a four-wide trail blaze. And Tashir is last of a tightly packed field that moves into the far turn. And Gambler's Ghost continues to lead the way. Wildcat Reds alongside, and they went 44-4 and four for a half mile. Then Mighty Brown followed by CZ, who's right alongside. Long on value, Spot in between horses. Pablo Del Monte, no place to go, just boxed in 
as they come to the top of the stretch. Wildcat Red runs for the lead, and Pablo Del Monte's got a spot now. Then comes CZ to the outside. Farther out, it's spot and long on value as Wildcat Red runs away to an impressive score in the Hutchison. Wildcat Red, nice piece of training by Jose Garofalo. He had told us on last week's show that he had him fit, and Wildcat Red proved much the best going 7-8s in the Hutchison. Now, I thought he relaxed very, very nicely, but the pace was lively. 22.30, 44.87, 109.57. When he stretches out next time in two turns in a fountain of youth, the pace won't be anywhere near that fast, and the first turn will come up quickly. But I did like the way he relaxed and the way he ran in the Hutchison. I think he's an underrated colt. I think in the end they're going to do very well with him sprinting middle distances. Interestingly, for the second week in a row at Gulfstream, following Cairo Prince in the Holy Bull, the 2-1 to one favorite, Wildcat Red, drifted up to that price late in the betting, just like Cairo Prince did in the Holy Bull. All right, time to update our Derby Dozen. As of February 8th, we stand just 12 weeks in front of America's Greatest Race, and we have no changes from last week. Sam Rod didn't quite make it here. Vince Ramos or Harpoon or Uncle Cy. So quickly as we take a look at our Derby Dozen, I'll let you know that Cairo Prince will next race in the Florida Derby. Midnight Hawk goes in this afternoon's Robert Lewis. Top billing is destined for the February 22nd Fountain of Youth. Honor Code, who is back galloping after bruising his rear heels, is likely to go in the Gotham. Shared belief on the West Coast for Jerry Hollendorfer. Hasn't had a time work since January 3rd. It is undecided where he goes next. My numbers 6 and 7, Cool Samurai and Candy Boy, both go in today's Bob Lewis. Strong Mandate will go in the February 17th Southwest at Oaklawn if they thaw out with Joel Rosario. At number nine is Vickers in Trouble, the February 22nd Risen Star. California Chrome is scheduled to go in the March 8th San Felipe. Havana had his first work since the Breeders' Cup last week. An easy three furlongs. He'll be going in the March 1st Swale. And Commissioner rounds it out. He will go next in the Fountain of Youth. So no changes from last week to this week, although in all likelihood there will be several changes for next week since three of the top seven go in this afternoon's Bob Lewis. Now, quickly, uh, today marks the final day of wagering in Pool 2 of the Derby Futures. As of late last night, there was about 120,000 in the pool. It closes at 6 o'clock this afternoon, well before the Robert Lewis. Now, folks, there's obviously a tremendous risk trying to find the winner of the Derby 12 weeks out from the first Saturday in May, so you must get some value. But you know I was thinking about this. There is a way to reduce some of the risk. Please understand that the next futures pool will be the end of this month, from February 27th through March 1st. And horses who aren't scheduled to race before that next futures pool, if you like any of them, why would you bet them now? There's more risk in betting them now and probably not any substantial gain rather than wait the three weeks for the next pool. Horses like Cairo Prince, California Chrome, Havana, Honor Code, Noble Moon, Samrot, Shared Belief, Uncle Cy, they are not scheduled to race again before the next futures pool. So if you like any of them, why bet them in this pool? Give yourself an additional three weeks and wait. Here are some of the prices quickly. The Paramutual Field, all other three-year-olds, are six to five. Shared Belief is the lowest price of any individual entrant at 12 to 1. Cairo Prince and Honor Code are both 15 to 1. Strong Mandate and Top Billing are both 18 to 1. And Midnight Hawk and Candy Boy, who both go this afternoon in the Bob Lewis. Midnight Hawk is 22 
and Candy Boy is 39. A quick look at Pool 2 of the Derby Futures. And we are up to our first break. When we return off to South Florida, where we'll welcome in Mr. Buff Bradley. As we go to the break, three-year-old fillies in the Las Virginis at Santa Anita. The even, num even money favorite, number eight streaming, coming off a victory in the Hollywood Starlet. So we will take a look at the Las Virginis to the break. Back with Buff Bradley right after these messages. And uh, away they go. Streaming began well from the outside gate. Tastes like candies out quickly and fashion plate on the inside. They ensure a quick early pace. St. Pete Jones racing right behind them in the fourth position. Then we come back to Sushi Empire fifth. A good five off the leaders. In behind that comes Arethusa and Artemis is last. Eight lengths covers them all. They head to the three-quarter pole and fashion plate along the inside, taken on by Taste Like Candy. They ensure there's good pace. They lead it by two. Streaming is lacing along in third, and then we have a gap of four back to Saintly Joan. Outside of her comes Sushi Empire, and at the back is Arethusa and Artemis, now a good ten off the lead. They run past the half mile pole and Fashion Plate now gone clear. Fashion Plate by two lengths. Tastes like candies in the second spot, been followed then by Streaming in third. A gap of five back to Sushi Empire. Artemis on the far side tries to make some headway with Arethusa and Saintly Jones dropped out. They have three eighths of a mile to go now and Fashion Plate still the leader. Taste like candy and streaming. They're coming to make it three in a line with a quarter of a mile to go. Behind that, Sushi Empire. Now Artemis picking it up on the outside and Arethusa. Artemis to Arethusa running on from behind. At the top of the lane, Fashion Plate's tough on the lead. Fashion Plate finds more and goes for home. Streaming on the outside of that. Arethusa tastes like candy. Coming to the 16th, Fashion Plate hanging on. Streaming up alongside. Fashion Plate streaming, streaming on the outside, Fashion Plate at the wire, Fashion Plate and Gary Stevens one in a neck. Streaming was second, Arethusa third and then tastes like candy. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Each morning on the OTB TV network, you get the very best in horse racing programming. Weekdays begin with the Handicappers Report, where professional handicappers share their selections and analysis of the day's racing. Followed by Racing Across America, a daily conversation with racing personalities from around the country. Saturdays include Down the Stretch, where Mark Cassano speaks with the biggest names in racing. And Sunday mornings, it's Loose on the Lead, where Steve Bick and I offer news and a unique lineup of weekly guests. All here on the OTB TV network. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. And fashion plate for Simon Callahan and Gary Stevens takes pressure throughout, then holds off streaming by a half length to win the Las Virginis. Our first guest this morning, along with the rest of us, will be bidding goodbye to two-time champion Groupie Dow following tomorrow's Hurricane Birdie at Gulfstream. We welcome in live via telephone from South Florida, Mr. Buff Bradley, Buff Mark Asano, welcoming you back to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Well, Buff, it's always nice to have you. This is a little bit of a different situation. Final time we're going to be talking about Groupie Doll. As we watch her win last year's Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint for the second year in a row, Buff, tell us, what has it been like to have bred her, owned her, trained her, and raced her over the last several years. And sold her as well, and then trained her again. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it, it has. It's been really good. It's, it's just been quite an experience, and to share it with my father and our family and, and team, it's, it's really been something special. And uh, just to, like you said, you know, from day one with her, um, knowing that you can have one of these kind of horses, I think it gives a lot of people hope that are in, in the business that... Uh, you know, there's possibility of uh, breeding one and keeping one such as Groupie Doll. Buff, I remember distinctly when you added blinkers to her and you really 
started to concentrate on races from six furlongs to a mile. How much difference did that make? Well, I think that that was the key, and, and she was maturing at the time, but definitely the blinkers helped, and we knew that uh, she, you know, running her along a few times, we we understood that she likes to make a run at the end of the race, and uh, we needed to just shorten her up a bit, and that's how come she got to be uh, so much in the sprint category. Well, this past January, you won a second Eclipse Award with Groupie Dow. You know, that, that's not easy to do, a multiple champion. What was it like, Buff, to win a second championship with her? Well, I mean, we knew uh, last winter when she wasn't doing as well uh, at Gulfstream and just needed some more time off um, from just getting beaten a cigar mile. Uh, we knew that we needed to, if we were going to go back and try to repeat, uh, which we, we knew would be difficult to do, but... Uh, we knew we'd give her some time off and try to bring her back for the fall, which is what we did, and it worked out. But her last race came against the boys in the Cigar Mile. As we pick it up for our audience, she will be fifth along the fence. An inside post that day cost her a clean trip. Talk about this effort, if you would. Well, she really ran a big race that day, uh, running against some nice horses and nice colts, and she's the only filly in the race, and... Uh, you know, I, her momentum got stopped pretty good, and, and for her to, for Rajiv to be able to pick her up and move her to the outside and still finish strong, still ran a big race and, and got back on the game after uh, she avoided the catastrophe. Buff, when current owner Mandy Pope told you after this uh, defeat that she was going to run again, we wanted to try to send her out a winner, what did that mean to you? Well, I, I applaud Mandy for that because, uh, you know, she's not doing it for the money. She wanted to, um, she, she wants the fans to enjoy her and she wants to see her too and, and race her and, and see everybody really enjoy this mare. Well, her final race will come tomorrow at Gulfstream in the Hurricane Birdie. Buff, how is she doing coming up to the race? Well, she, she's coming up to the race really, really good, Mark. She. Um, I mean, she was just so great today. Uh, quite a few fans were out there watching her train, and and Mandy was there as well. And uh, Mandy, in fact, was helping give her a bath after she came back to be cooled out. And um, you know, it's uh, you know we feel like that we're we're probably the best on paper in the race and the class of the race. But you know, you still got to line up and and go at them. And uh, we're gonna. You know, it's, it's still not a walkover, so we're, we're going to have to get in there and run regardless. Yeah, and the inside post, obviously not ideal. No, we've, uh, we've been very lucky, though. We've, we've gone to the outside several times in the big, big races, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I think we'll just have to look at it. Maybe uh, a little different game plan, but we'll still let her run her race. Buff, what would it mean to you to be able to send her home a winner? Well, I, obviously, I mean, that's, uh, that would be the, the icing on the cake. Um, this race is as important as, as many of her others, and uh, it would just be really good for, for both Groupie and Mandy to, to see her go out a winner. Well, Buff, it has been a blast over the last couple of years having you on the show, talking about Groupie Dow, watching her progress to become a multiple champion. Congratulations to you and your staff on a great job, and all the best with her in tomorrow's finale in the Hurricane Birdie. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's always been a pleasure to be on your show and, and share our, our thoughts with Groupie Dow. She's the uh, She's been a special one, and, and we like to share, and we know she's got a pretty good fan base out there, and that's, that's good. We like to see the fans out there and watching her and cheering her on. Well, Buff, again, thank you. All the best in tomorrow's race. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Buff Bradley, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, that blinker change and the strategy of going from middle distance races to concentrating on mostly six and seven for a long races, but of course a couple of starts in the cigar mile made her a multiple 
champion. And we are up to our next break. When we return, it's out to Southern California, where we'll welcome in Mr. John Sheriffs as we go to the break. More three-year-old fillies in action, this time in the busher here in New York. The 17 to 10 favorite, number five, Bally Lee. So we will take a look at the busher going to the break. Back with John Sheriffs right after these messages. And they're off. It's Fierce Boots. Going out for the lead. Kettle Twist is right there. And on the outside, Vera Amorte, a close-up third. Fleet of Gold is down on the inside and fourth. Bally Lee was off just a step slow and is now racing in fifth as they head for the clubhouse turn. Fierce Boots on top here. It's Fierce Boots in front. Bally Lee is looking to come on through in between horses. She's sitting right behind a Kettle Twist, who's a bit tough to handle there as they approach the back stretch. Fierce Boots on top and Kettle Twist giving chase in second with Fleet of Gold down on the inside in third. Vero More on the outside in fourth. Bally Lee is fifth, four lengths from the front. Then it's a gap of seven lengths to my Jimmy Choo girl and joint return. They're midway up the back stretch with Fierce Boots in front by a length. Kettle Twist in second by a neck. And down on the inside is a Fleet of Gold in third by a head. Vero More is fourth. Bally Lee in fifth, now six lengths off the lead. Farther back, my Jimmy Choo girl in joint return. The quarter in 24 and 2. The half mile in 50 and 1 fifth seconds. And they're rounding the far turn with Fierce Boots, the leader by a half length. Kettle Twist continues to run in second. And Vera Amore is third. Now Bally Lee begins to pick it up four wide. And joint return is five wide as the field turns for home. Three quarters in 1 15 and 4. On the far outside, it's joint return. Kettle Twist is there. Vera Amore in between horses. Now Bally Lee is tailed off. Fierce Boots is down at the rail. Joint return in front. And Joint Return has made a last to first move to win the busher. Joint return by four. Vera Amore was second, and Kettle Twist finished third. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, an amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Buff Bradley once again for having joined us. And joint return for John Service and Kendrick Carmouche from last to first to win the busher by four and a quarter. Our next guest has a busy afternoon in front of him uh, today at Santa Anita, highlighted by the stakes debut of my number six derby prospect, Cool Samurai, in the Robert Lewis. We welcome in live via telephone, Mr. John Sheriffs. John Marcusano, welcoming you back to the show. Hi, Mark. Glad to be here. Nice to have you as always, John. Let's get started. And as we go back and watch the Belmont debut of Cool Samurai back in October, and for our audience, he is number eight in here, he will rally for second. John, I'm pretty sure I remember you had him at Saratoga last summer with you. Why didn't he end up racing until here in late October? Uh, you know, uh, interestingly, uh when I got to Saratoga, the cool samurai was up there with uh, David Figueroa. And so when he came up, it, it was really, you know, a little bit of a bad actor in that he liked to get on a time bike rare and, and act up. So I said, well, you know, let's not fool around with him. Um, let's take him out and gallop. I told the rider, gallop him twice around that Oklahoma track, and that'll tire him out. He'll behave himself better the next day. Well... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. When I watched him gallop around Oklahoma, that deep track, and he 
he was just as strong, and this is a young two-year-old, just as strong going around the second time as he was the first time. I thought, my goodness, this horse has got a wonderful way of going and a huge stride. So then, you know, then we started playing around with him. Anybody that's familiar with uh, Saratoga knows what a, what a fun facility it is. So I remember Alan Jerk has always used to have those uh, towels with him, the rubber rag stuff to, to play with the horses, sort of distract them wish the flies, etc., like that. So I told Kevin, Kevin, why don't you take a towel with it so he doesn't think about you so much, you know. I didn't want him to think about his rider as much as something else, take his mind off the rider. So we did that, and he got better and better, you know, for a while. Then he got over rearing up and all that stuff. So we used to go from, we used to go from uh, Oklahoma all the way over to Clare Court to Gallup. So he'd get a lot of experience going through the parking lot, across the road, past the main track and down there because he was a, one a, horse, he was a horse that liked to just play around too much. John, take a moment. We're going to have a shot of him on the screen for our audience in just a moment. Take a moment to describe him from a physical <laughs> standpoint, if you would. Uh, you know, okay, so he has a big frame. He's a, he's a large horse. He doesn't look that large to speak up next to him. Then you notice what a big frame he has. Uh, he has a, it's kind of a long, thin neck, a nice high withers, um, le- very long in the underline and in his back, and then a, a pretty strong hind end from behind. Doesn't necessarily have a, a long hip, but has a strong he- hind end from behind. So, um, you know, he, he's got the uh, the makings of a, of a really uh, well balanced, lengthy horse. He was 56 to 1 in that debut we just watched. So it was a major surprise to the betters that he ran as well as he did. What did you think about his debut? You know, we were excited about it. We were really excited about watching him run. Um, Alex uh, Solis was working him, and Alex really liked him. And, uh, you know, it, t- it takes him a little bit to, uh, to get everything straightened out in his mind when he starts to run. So he's a little high-headed. It takes a moment to get into stride and to drop his head and, and lengthen his stride. But, um, you know, we knew that once he found his stride, you know, he could just keep coming and coming and coming. John, we are about to take a look at him break his maiden on December 27th at Santa Anita. For our audience, he is number three. Talk about this effort, if you would. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe it. You know, the one thing we wanted him to do was go in the gate and break decent, right? So, of course, he didn't want to load, <laughs> you know. And, and Cool Samurai is like, oh, you want to fight with me? Okay, I'd love to fight back with you, you know. So he, and, you know, in the afternoon, the, the assistant starters don't have a lot of time to bet him and talk to him to get to the gate. So they're in a hurry. So that was just awful. So it. He's in the gate. I don't. I don't even think he was standing right. When the gate opens, it looked like he just hopped in the air. His head is, went up, and all four legs went in a different direction. And I didn't know if he was ever going to get it together. But finally, finally, after a while, he he starts getting into the rhythm of the race. He got into the rhythm of the race. He's about to make a nice move down the backside to get into contention. Looks like he waited a while to level out in the lane, but once he leveled out, he kicked in nicely. Mike Smith rode him for you this day. Mike's been on a few good racehorses in his lifetime. John, what did he have to say to you after the race? Uh, he, he was very excited after the race. He was very excited. He, he liked them a lot. It looks like, and, and you talked about him early on at Oklahoma, it looks like this colt will relish a route of ground. Oh, no doubt. That's that's what he wants. You know, he, he um, yeah, he he really will relish uh, going distance. You know, he's and and he's you know he's a little immature. It's going to take him a while to really put it together. We'll see. We'll see this afternoon. We've schooled him a lot at the gate, and hopefully that won't be an issue. He's. You know, he's a funny horse. He's very good. When we take him to the paddock, he's calm, he's collected, he's cool and everything. But when he gets presented with something that he doesn't really understand or, or um, is slightly confused or is thinking about something else, it takes him a little bit to get 
to adjust to that. He's had a series of seven furlong works. I love these <laughs> works. I mean, they're old fashioned. Are you pleased with the way he's been working in the mornings? Yeah, you know, I was uh, so I was thinking to myself, what what should I do? You know, what should I do with him? You know, I don't want, particularly want to go fast. I don't want to do a try to go in a minute or a forty eight or something like that. I want I want to really develop his stride. So I decided, well, I was going to work him seven eights, and he's a young three year old too. And he was so it's a lot to ask, you know. And I did three of them in a row, and, and he um, he handled them very well. I just wanted him to get to repeat his stride, repeat his stride, repeat his stride, so his stride would become more like second nature to him, so he, he would know, oh, okay, I'm in my stride. John, is he the type of colt, you, you, or gelding, I should say, um, you mentioned he's a march foal. Is he the type of young horse who should improve with more racing? Absolutely. That's, that's it. Like I said, you know, it's a little confusing for him. He doesn't always want to cooperate right away. So with the experience, with having a good experience in racing, I think he, he will improve. Do you have a schedule penciled in for him following this afternoon's Robert Lewis? Oh, uh, no. I tell you, you know, we'll just do it one race at a time. Santa Anita has a wonderful uh, program for uh, three- and four-year-olds, so there's lots of opportunities to race. You can be honest with our audience. Am I nuts to have him at number six on my <laughs> derby list? I mean, does he have the potential quality to be a legitimate Kentucky Derby candidate? You know, uh, so from my experience, the one thing Giacomo had was a big stride. It, he had a, it was a big, effortless stride, and nothing bothered him, you know, so I think any young horse that has that big ground-covering stride with talent has the possibilities to uh, develop into that type of horse. All right. Now, John, I mentioned in the intro you're going to have a busy afternoon as you're represented in all three stakes. You've got Blingo facing Game on Dude in this afternoon San Antonio. How's he doing? Uh, Blingo is another one that, that's a little bit different. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Blingo is doing very well. Uh, he's, we've been, we moved out of Hollywood Park a couple of weeks ago, so we've had an opportunity to do a lot of schooling with Blingo. And that was the one thing in his last race that, that, that he really needed. He didn't have a chance to school, so we had a lot of trouble with him between the receiving barn and the uh, saddling enclosure. So since then, we've spent a lot of time schooling him. And I, I think uh, Blingo has... He's one of those horses that could run a really dynamite race at any time. And you've got long shot Utopian for the grassy San Marcos. He didn't run badly last time. You know, we were, he, we were very happy. He hadn't run in a long time and uh, hadn't really trained them really hard for that race. Uh, so Jose Valdivia said, well, you know, some of these older horses, you never know if they still want to go again. But he said when he asked him to pick it up at the top of the lane, the horse kicked in for him. So he said, you know, this horse still has a lot of enthusiasm for racing. So I think that uh, with the race under his belt and the additional training, he should run well also. And finally, John, as it was about, I don't know, three degrees or five degrees here <laughs> overnight, it reminds me to ask you, are you planning on coming back to Belmont this spring and summer? Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we certainly are. Well, we will look forward to your return along with the warmer weather. We'll look forward to all your stake starters later this afternoon, particularly Cool Samurai in the Robert Lewis. And, John, as always, we thank you for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Thanks. Thank you, John. John Sheriffs, ladies and gentlemen. You know, he doesn't have to win this afternoon. In fact, it would be a bit of a surprise if he beat Midnight Hawk and Candy Boy, but you know, he doesn't have it together. And I remember years ago when John Service told us about a little known horse that the light bulb went on and that little known horse became Smarty Jones. You know, you never know what can happen with horses when that light bulb goes on. 
and uh, maybe it'll go on in the Bob Lewis this afternoon for Cool Samurai. And we are up to our final break. When we return, Mr. Rick Mati will join us as we go to the break. The Palace Verdes at Santa Anita. Field of only five, but two of them were finalists for champion sprinter of 2013. Number four, Secret Circle, was the odds-on favorite. Number two, Sahara Sky, making his first start since a victory in last year's Met Mile was the five to two second choice. So we'll take a look at the Palace Verdes to the break. Back with Rick Matee right after these messages. And uh, away they go to a perfect start. Majestic stride, secret circle of quick into stride, and Moonshine Bay from the outside gate right there too. Wild Dude is down at the rail, and Sahara Skies at the back. Four lengths would cover the lot. They head to the half-mile pole, and it's Secret Circle on the inside of Moonshine Bay. Those two go clear now by just over two. Majestic Stride right there in third, and Wild Dude now giving them five-length starts. Sahara Sky is last. Into the turn they go. Moonshine Bay on the far side, and Secret Circle at the rail, head and head into the turn. It's two and a half back to Majestic Stride in the third spot, being followed by Wild Dude, still five off them. Sahara Sky last. Coming to the quarter pole and Moonshine Bay now takes the lead. Secret Circle on the inside still right there. Majestic Stride comes after them third and Wild Dude is in with a shot coming on from fourth. Homeward bound now and Secret Circle fully extended on the inside. Moonshine Bay and here comes Wild Dude now. Wild Dude, can he get through? He's going to try to hook to the outside. Secret Circle, Moonshine Bay. Wild Dude flying. Wild Dude will get up. Wild Dude got lucky there. He got out and got up to win it. Wild Dude, Secret Circle and Moonshine Bay. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTB.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTB.com. Log on today. Funding your Capital OTB bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to John Sheriffs once again for having joined us. And wild dude for Jerry Hollendorfer. Rafael Bejarano extricates himself from traffic in the lane to run down Secret Circle by a neck to win the Palace Verdes. Sahara Sky trailed throughout. Our final guest this morning will be saddling one of my favorites, Brujo de Aleros. For this afternoon's Gulfstream Sprint, we welcome in live via telephone from very warm South Florida, Mr. Rick Matti. Rick Marcasano, welcome you back to the show. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here again. Nice to have you as always. Rick, I want to take you and the audience back to the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. And for our audience, Brujo de Aleros, number four in here. Rick, considering that on this Friday of Breeders' Cup weekend, the main track was about as close to being unfair to closers as it could be. How do you feel Brujo de, de Aleros ran in here? Oh, he ran great. Uh, you know, it was a, a, a real warm day, and uh, he got a little warm out there in front of the big crowd. He was just starting to get a winter coat in, and it was a real warm day to start off with. So he had that kind of going against him, and he got a little hot going to the gate, but not bad. But what hurt, what hurt him was when he went into the first turn, he kind of got pinched back a little bit. And we, you know, it wasn't by design that we were that far back, but uh, we just got. And, and of all days to get pinched and, yeah. and to fall back in a big field, this was the worst possible day. As you said, the jock said it wasn't just so much the track, it was the kickback coming back in the jockey's face and the horse's face that the horse just wouldn't run into it. And uh, Alan said Brujo would run into dirt before. He said he just 
it, it took him about a half mile before he, he really kind of buckled down and started to run, but by that time he was pretty far back. And um, so to answer your question, to, all things considered, I think we have to be very happy with him running one to get third in there. Rick, what have you learned about this six-year-old ever since you got him? Well, you know, obviously I didn't have a chance to work around him as a, a four-year-old when he first came up um, from South America. And I think, you know, they ran him a couple of times, and I think Graham wisely backed off him after the, after the grass experiment. And then he went down to Florida, and, and like a lot of those Southern Hemisphere horses, it takes him a long time to acclimate, Mark. And I think that was his, his biggest problem. I think he went down there, and he went down to uh, Ocala to a guy named Bill Riccio, who was Arnold Winnick's assistant for a long time, and he did a real good job with him there. And uh, by the time he got sent up to me in um, May, he was uh, a different horse. He really was was into his works again and uh, going forward. And uh, everything really with him has been pretty straightforward. Uh, I think the longer we've had him, the easier he's gotten to work around. He's kind of a high-energy horse, sort of a tightly wound horse by nature. And uh, so I think we've, uh, me and my staff and my riders have done a good job just trying to get him settled down. But um, really, for the most part, he's a pretty straightforward horse. And we're just still working out this year as a five-year-old now what his best trip will be. Will it be around one turn? Will it be around two turns? So we're still not sure what we exactly have in terms of his best trip. But um, at least today, he's He's fit and ready to go. Seven eighths is a good comeback distance for him, as it was last year. So, uh, you know, all systems go really today. Rick, that's really interesting because I liked him in the Kelso. I liked him in the Dirt Mile. And I'm thinking that he is one of the better Dirt Milers in America in 2014 or has the potential to be. And my question to you was going to be, were you or are you going to concentrate on races at, you know, seven-eighths to a mile. As I said, nothing's really etched in stone. This, we, we ended up running in this race today, Mark, is it four weeks from now you have the Gulfstream Park uh, Handicap, which is a one-turn mile dirt race, and that's the race we were really pointing for. And at first we were just going to train him up to that race off works, but he's come to hand so well, and we just thought it might be easier on just to get this comeback race in him at seven, and uh, not really train him quite as hard as we would have had to for the mile race off the layoff. And then after that, you know, Barry and I have, you know, the Metro- Metropolitan Miles, a bigger pot this year. It's yeah. going to be on the Belmont Stakes undercard. That's an, a logical spot to, uh, to point for. So I think, you know, you know, there just aren't enough of those one-turn mile races. I can't tell you specifically he'll never go further than that. I know Alan always feels that that was his best trip, the one-turn mile. Uh, Cintron got off him after the race at Delaware, and I realized it was, again, much lesser competition, but he didn't seem to think two turns running further was going to be an issue, at least up to about a mile and eighth anyway. But just, you know, the Met Mile would be an obvious race to target if he comes out of this race, and then the next race, the Gulfstream Park Handicap, uh, first part of March, four weeks from today. Um, That would be the the logical race to point him for. And then, uh, you know, at the end of the year, obviously, you get the Breeders' Cup back at Santa Anita. you got the Cigar Mile. Uh, so there's a number of ways we could go with it. I can't tell you that we'd never try him around in, in a two-turn race in between that. But, uh, you know, like you said, you know, we're just hoping that uh, he can. He just needs to probably improve a little bit off his four-year-old form, but we think he can. He's still a relatively lightly raced horse. So, Rick, is this afternoon strictly a prep for the Gulfstream Park Handicap, or can he win it off the layoff? I think he can win off the layoff if he can stay close enough. There doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of speed in this for a seven furlong race right. in Florida in the winter. You know, sometimes these races just, can just be loaded with 44 and change horses, but this one doesn't seem to be today. So if he can break well and get a position and not get too far back, I think he's fit enough to win. I think if he's got to spot these horses, you know, too, too many lengths and gets in a bit of trouble. Let's face it, there's not a lot of difference between a lot of these horses. You know, it, it's one of those races, five or six of them could easily win the race. And uh, he's certainly got enough fitness to win it. As you can see from the work tabs, we, we really haven't put the screws to him that much. 
on his second work back, that five-eighths in a minute was out in like 13 flat. That was a really good work. And then since that time, we gave him like a, a long, easy six, and then a, a pretty easy five. So as you can see, we, you know, that the race in four weeks is clearly the one we're pointing for. But this horse wasn't really let down much off that Breeders' Cup mile. You know, he pretty much came down to Florida and was in light training um, the rest of November. But he's been in full training, um, you know, since that time. So I don't. It's not like he's coming off a, a real long layoff. He's kind of a, as I said earlier, a tightly wound sort of horse by nature. So I think if he can stay relatively close, he can beat him. But I think if he could shuffle too far back, I don't think Allen's going to belly down and be too hard on him to try and win the race, if you know what I mean. Rick, let's talk about your three-year-old prospect, Mexi Coma. Here he is for our audience, breaking his maiden by a pole last September at Delaware Park. How is he doing? He's done great. He was another one when we, after the Breeders' Cup, that race took a pretty good bit out of the source. Uh, he was a little tired after that. We got him down to Florida, and it took him a while to, to really uh, start grabbing this track down here. We had just had some issues with him with his hind end when we first brought him back, and that's why it's taken so long to get him back to the races. But he's going great guns right now. We're just kind of behind the eight ball a little bit in terms of getting a comeback race into him. We'd hope to have him back by now, but... Uh, he did a real good piece of work the other day. He did a nice uh, six furlongs, and he'll work again this week. So hopefully we can get a race in him by the end of the month anyway. Uh, are you looking at uh, an allowance race for his comeback or, an, or, or another stakes race? What are you thinking of at this point? Ideally, we'd get an allowance race for him around two turns, and then... Uh, you know, obviously, we need to. He doesn't have any points yet for for the Kentucky Derby. So, uh, you know, if he gets a good comeback race into him, ideally that would be an allowance. But if an allowance doesn't fail or anything, we're probably going to have to stick him in a straight a stake straight off the bat, which isn't really ideal for a horse that's only run three times. So, hopefully, we can get an allowance into him before uh, the end of the month. Rick, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best uh, with Brujo de Aleros this afternoon and bringing back Mexicoma, and we'll look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you, Rick. Rick Matee, ladies and gentlemen. All right, got a couple of uh, news and notes for you before we leave you this morning, beginning with Verrazano and some good news. He's going to be staying in training instead of going off to stud. That's the good news. He's going to be racing in Europe with Aiden O'Brien. So we won't see him during the year. Although, remember, O'Brien ships for the Breeders' Cup a lot. So it wouldn't be surprising at all to see Verrazano back for this year's Breeders' Cup, probably on turf. And general challenge. The winner of the 1999 Santa Anita Derby and Pacific Classic, as well as the 2000 Big Cap was euthanized this past Tuesday at the age of 18. An executive privilege, a four-year-old filly who earned just shy of a million dollars has been retired. She won half of her 10 career races, including the Del Mar Debutante and the Chandelier. And Chrysalium, the impressive winner of last year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf, has died. She was euthanized on Friday due to very serious foot infection. Big news from Naira. When we spoke to their new vice president of racing, Martin Pans, about five weeks ago, one of the things he talked about was creating big days of racing. Well, he's created a monster for this year's Belmont Stakes Day. It's going to be a 13 race card with 10 of them being stakes races worth a total of $8 million. The million and a half Belmont Stakes the Met Mile will now be on the Belmont Stakes undercard, an extra half a million, so that's 1.25 million. Huge increases for the Manhattan, which is now a million. The Ogden Phipps for a million. The Just a Game and the Acorn for three quarters of a million. The Brooklyn at a half million. The Woody Stevens at a half million. This becomes the second richest card in North American racing behind only the Breeders' Cup. This is an incredible decision by Naira. 
10 stakes races on one day. Now be careful. Just because Naira is offering this incredible amount of purse monies doesn't automatically mean you're going to have big fields and the best racing that you could possibly have. Folks, remember something. There's only so many stakes horses out there. So you reach a threshold as far as purse monies offered. When you go beyond that threshold, it's not going to make that much of a difference. I, I love big days of racing. I'm all for them. I don't like 13 race cards. But I don't remember 10 stakes races on a single card. In my memory here in New York, I think that is a first. All right. Time to wrap things up and thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air here at the studios of the Clubhouse Racebook in Albany, our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, and Brian Dorenzo. Back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta directed, handled pre-production, and Peter Persico, who just celebrated his 25th year here at the network. Congratulations to Pete, was on audio. Our guests, thanks to Buff Bradley and John Sheriffs and Rick Matee, and as always, thank you so much. Terrific weekend of racing. Remember, tomorrow, you got Groupie Dolls finale. You got Will Take Charge in the Don. You've got a fascinating race in the Gulfstream Turf Handicap. This afternoon is the Robert Lewis. So, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy all the racing action from coast to coast this weekend. Capital, have a wonderful upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week. Watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.